ladies and gentlemen, one of 54 Naval Academy graduates accepted into the NASA program, astronaut and Captain Kay Hyer. everybody for uh, coming out and all of those uh, online. Uh, this is a great opportunity for uh, me to talk about the things that I love, flying in space and the Navy. So uh, when you talk about space in the United States, you think of NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Certainly from its very beginnings, we've had a very close tie with the Navy. NASA was actually formed when a lot of this science fiction was starting to come true. Prior to NASA, shortly after the birth of naval aviation, NACA was formed. That was the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. They've been around since 1915, doing a lot of aviation type of development, wind tunnels and such. So when uh, we started looking at going further and going into space, the federal government formed NASA, the National um, uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration and took NACA, all of the resources, all the people, all the work they were doing, turned that over into the new agency. And at the same time, there was a little group of folks down at the Naval Research Lab who were working on rockets and uh, doing pretty well, actually. And that whole group got picked up and moved into NASA as well. So the Navy has, uh, like I said, very, very strong uh, ties intimately with NASA. And of course, NASA, does the aeronautical research. A lot of folks forget about that, but we are very deep into making uh, aviation travel, especially commercial aviation travel, safer, working on the next generation of air traffic control and that type of thing. You know NASA for its earth science, its uh, weather satellites. Uh, we've got one going up hopefully today. We've been having a few delays on our JPSS uh, satellite launch out of uh, California in uh, conjunction with NOAA to get our next generation of weather satellites up, but uh, we're working on that. We'll get there. Earth science, uh, planetary science, and of course, human uh, exploration of space. But in the interest of time and to stay on focus today, I'm just going to talk about the human exploration of space. So going back and, and trying to also tie this to the Navy and to science fiction, it's funny because a lot of things that were science fiction actually became true. It was just more of a forecast of what we were going to do. Going all the way back to uh, the origin of the word astronaut, the title astronaut. There's a little bit of debate about where that first shows up, but it first shows up in science fiction. And uh, they think that uh, it came from the Greek word astron for star and nautis for sailor. So again, our ties to the Navy star sailors, astronauts. So the rich history and deep involvement with the Navy and uh, uh, so many parallels today and even going into the future. So talking about today, we'll go ahead and start that. I'll just give you something that happened less than a week ago. This is right here on the coast of Virginia at Wallops Island, Virginia. Launch pad 088 on Sunday morning. Did you get up and watch it? I was there. I was there Saturday too, but uh, anyway. Uh, this is the Antares rocket, which is carrying the Cygnus cargo module. This module is named Spaceship Cernan, Gene Cernan, for uh, astronaut, former naval aviator Gene Cernan. So as we watch this uh, launch on uh, Sunday morning, uh, it was very impressive to be there in person. You can go ahead and uh, stop the video. This was uh, headed off to the International Space Station. So this is an UNREP mission, right, to relate it to the Navy. Our International Space Station has had a crew on board 24-7 for the last 17 years straight. The very first commander of the first expedition to stay on board, Naval Academy graduate, Navy SEAL, Bill Shepard. So 17 years of this, and you can go ahead to the next, 53 expeditions later, we don't actually call them crews, we call them expeditions. 
because what they're doing is so incredibly similar to the expeditions of our early explorers. So this is the current Expedition 53 on board the International Space Station. Of note would be the uh, commander of this uh, expedition, retired Marine Corps Colonel Randy Bresnik. We also have uh, two other uh, U.S. astronauts on board, Army Colonel Mark Vandehei and former Marine Joe Acaba, international uh, astronaut with us from Italy, Paolo Nespoli, and we also have uh, Sergei uh, Vlanzansky and also Alexander Mazurkin. This is not a seventh crew member. Uh, in the center there is just a, a little bit of a sample of how we, uh, we do a lot of outreach. We do a lot of work while we're on the space station, but we also understand the importance and the impact of the influence. So we do a lot of work up there. That is, um, it's a spacesuit. It's kind of in two pieces. I think they just put it on top of one of our existing spacesuits. The artwork on there was actually done by uh, children at MD Anderson Cancer Hospitals. And they sent that up to the crew on board uh, to just show their, their interest and support. So here comes the, uh, go ahead. Here comes the SS spaceship Gene Cernan. Uh, it was launched Sunday morning from the coast of Virginia. It arrived there at the International Space Station on Tuesday morning. And it, it flies up there on its own power. It's actually uh, got a lot of uh, really great things. This has uh, been developed and expanded over the years. There's just shy of 7,400 pounds of uh, research equipment, scientific research experiment materials, uh, food, clothing, and spare parts on board. Also on board are several uh, new technologies we're developing, even on the module itself, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later on. Next slide. So again, like I said, uh, in Navy terms, this is an unrep to an outpost, okay, or if you will, a ship. Uh, both of these vehicles, the International Space Station and the Cygnus cargo module, obviously they come together where the relative speeds become zero, and the crew actually flies the robotic arm, reaches out and grapples this uh, cargo module and then brings it in and boats it to the International Space Station, uh, then equalizes the pressure across the hatches and opens the hatches and it's like Christmas, you know, Ooh, what did we get? Uh, but about 7,400 pounds worth of uh, work, actually. <laughs> uh, but you know, the, uh, the thing is they don't unload it all at once. Uh, we have to also pace them, uh, you know, so that they don't stay up all night or something trying to unload. They've already pre-staged a good bit of um, trash near where this is going to be. So they unload the things and we try to load it in such a way that they get to the stuff they need first. But as they unload it, they then load the cargo module with trash. And eventually what will happen is uh, sometime in December, uh, we will go ahead and unberth the uh, uh, cargo module full of trash. And it actually will perform a few experiments on the way out and then eventually uh, go into a deorbit that will cause it to uh, break up and burn up. And that's how we dispose of our trash on the International Space Station. And next slide. So uh, I mentioned all the uh, experiments that are going up as well. Here, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but I do encourage you, if you're interested at all, please do go on to the uh, NASA websites and to take a look at some of the experiments. Like I said, 17 years we have been conducting experiments just on the International Space Station. Uh, throughout the entire space shuttle program, we were conducting experiments. And you say, why are you doing these experiments? We need to learn how to live and work in space but it also turns out by doing that, we also learn more about uh, living and working here on our own planet. So a lot of these uh, sciences and technologies that we discover apply directly right here on Earth. So some of the things here, these are actually uh, heart cells that we're looking at the effects of microgravity. We do have a DNA sequencer on board the International Space Station. That's important for even anal analyzing what we even find on board and just some of the, the science that's going on. So. What are we doing with all this? Well, again, relating back to science fiction, you know, science fiction used to talk about Martians and going to Mars. We're going there, okay? Uh, so that is our, our goal. Let's go ahead next. Mars. So this is definitely in uh, NASA's strategy. Uh, more recently, we're looking at uh, going uh, back to the moon and then on to Mars. 
But let's just look at the big picture here. We have a lot of puzzles to solve on the way to Mars. And that would be, first of all, how to get there. Once we get there, how do we land? How are we going to live and work on the surface of Mars or underneath, who knows? How do we lift off of the surface and safely return? Oh, and wrap all around that. This is exponentially a greater distance and a greater duration than we've ever experienced in all of our years of uh, human space flight. Next slide. All right, let's start with how to get there. Uh, this part is not science fiction. The Orion spacecraft and the space launch system are being built. The Orion spacecraft has actually uh, already had a test flight. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, we have hardware that's being built and developed uh, for these missions. And again, it's a bit of a challenge how to get there. You know, low Earth orbit, where the International Space Station is, about 250 miles up, uh, you can get to a low Earth orbit in eight and a half minutes. The moon only takes three days. Mars is going to take between six and nine months, depending on where it is, because the Earth is moving and Mars is moving, so the distance is always changing a bit. Six to nine months to get to Mars, because we have to travel an average of about 140 million miles. Exponentially a longer time. So a trip to and from Mars, we're looking notionally about three years. So we have a concept of the Deep Space Gateway, and that's this vehicle here, a Deep Space Gateway, and this is the Orion capsule that you saw from before. The Deep Space Gateway is like, uh, I kind of think of it as an aircraft carrier almost, that this is going to be in the region of Mars, it will be there, and from there we can launch missions, whether it's to the surface of the moon or all the way out to Mars. So uh, it's going to be a, a really interesting place, and we're uh, actively working on the development of this concept and, again, to solve all these challenges. So that was kind of the getting there. So once you get to Mars, how do you land? Well, we're still working on that. There are a lot of different concepts, but what I wanted to show you right here is the Curiosity landing sequence. So the Curiosity rover that's been on the surface of Mars uh, getting us incredible data. Uh, the folks at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California in uh, conjunction with NASA came up with this very innovative sequence where they uh, actually separated the heat shield and then they had a back shell separation. And uh, folks can uh, look that up. I'm not going to go into detail, but this just shows you how a bit complicated it is just for a rover. But just to give you an idea, though, of the complexity when we start to send a human mission, this rover was about one metric ton. When we send a, a human mission to Mars, we're expecting between 20 and 40 tons that we're going to need, not only for the equipment that we're going to need to live and work on the surface, but also the propellant and the vehicle we're going to need to be able to leave the surface. So again, exponentially greater uh, complex problem. So once we're on the surface of Mars, how do we live and work on the surface of Mars? So uh, just the operations in general, and let's just talk the number one thing that with NASA always is safety. So some of the things we've already been looking at, again, all the way back to uh, Space Shuttle where we had lots of experiments, we're looking at uh, fire because two of the main things that can go wrong on a spaceship are the same main things that can go wrong on a submarine. And certainly we've shared a lot of technology and operations and techniques from the submarine force. So what am I talking about? The two worst things that can happen on a submarine. Any submariners here? Okay. What we say, oh, there you go. Okay, uh, you can just nod your head if you agree with me. Yes, a breach of the pressure hull. Bad. bad. <laughs> Toxic environment. Very bad. Very bad. These are the two very bad things. Obviously, a submarine has the high pressure outside, spacecraft has the vacuum outside, or at least lower pressure. And uh, so we share a lot of the technologies. Um, and one of the, but one of the things that's a little strange for us in the microgravity of space shows on this slide, hot air rises here when you have gravity. Hot air does not rise in the microgravity of space. Fire acts differently. 
fire suppression has to be different. So uh, we've been studying fire for quite some time. As a matter of fact, the uh, cargo module I showed you, the SSG and Cernan, has a, uh, um, go ahead and split the slide, has an experiment on board after it undocks from the station. We don't want to light something off while we're still attached to the space station. But after it undocks from the space station, we've got it instrumented. This experiment right here has materials on board where uh, we're going to purposely set it on fire and study it. And by the way, this is not the first time we're doing this. Uh, we've actually had several of these experiments fly. So this is just showing different types of materials and how they, how they burn in that microgravity environment of space. So safety first. Next thing is life support. Next slide. Life support systems uh, for spacecraft. Of course, we have to have uh, oxygen, we have to have water, uh, th things like that. On board the International Space Station, we've had these, exp uh, this is, these aren't really experiments because they're operational. We have an oxygen generation system and a water recovery system. And uh, what we need to do, they, I will tell you right now, they are not a closed system. In other words, we're not 100% recapturing the oxygen. We, we actually consume a good bit of it and then also on the water recovery. But the numbers are pretty good and, but, and we want to make them better uh, before we get to Mars. And at some point, you know, it's almost, almost impossible to achieve a closed uh, system unless somebody's got a really good idea, please come talk to us. But what that means is we're going to continue to have to replenish that somehow, either finding that water and oxygen where you are on the surface or under the surface of Mars or the moon or wherever, um, or send it up logistically. Next up, uh, slide, food. Uh, well, again, you can either send it up or maybe you can grow it where you are. Uh, these are some of the experiments that have been going on on the International Space Station. Uh, this is two years ago. That's uh, retired Navy Captain Scott Kelly. And uh, they're eating lettuce that they harvested. They're on the uh, International Space Station. And last month, they, this is three different types of lettuce that they grew and they've been harvesting. So uh, we're advancing the actual plant habitats as we go. We're getting better all the time. Next slide. Operations, just operationally, how do we operate in this space environment? We also have to con uh, consider logistics. I already talked about that. Can't pull over to the closest uh, convenience store. So in that, again, we share a lot with the Navy and Marine Corps operating in very remote sites. And uh, maintenance. How do we maintain all of these systems? Well, one of the ways is don't make such a complicated system. So we're trying, a lot of our space systems are very complicated, and so we're trying to make them uh, simpler and certainly more maintainable by the crew that's there. And one of the things we already have on the International Space Station, Space Station 3D uh, printing or additive manufacturing, that's a, a little uh, ratchet wrench there that's made on a 3D printer. So there's no way you're going to be able to carry all your spare parts, but what about being able to make them with a 3D printer? Uh, uh, expandable habitat that's on the International Space Station we've been testing, and some uh, new generation uh, solar arrays are just, just some of the examples. We certainly have uh, lots of examples. So continuing just in the thought of operations, how do we operate on the surface of Mars? One of the issues is going to be communications. With that distance, it can be up to a 20 minute delay between you know, transmitting on the surface of Mars and that signal being received on, on Earth and such. So, you know, all of us are addicted to pretty instant communications. We are absolutely going to have to change the way we operate with that. So on board the uh, cargo module that just arrived this week uh, was also uh, some CubeSats with some experiments for uh, optical communications or laser comm, if you will. And they're actually on CubeSats, which is pretty neat because um, we're getting smaller with the uh, comms and looking at the uh, optical communications between the CubeSats and the ground. We'll be testing that in December. Go on. So beyond uh, the operations while we're living and working on the surface, we need to also think about the effect on the human body and just not only on the human body, but on human performance as well. You don't want to get all the way to, uh, to Mars and, and not be able to perform. So we've been conducting studies ever since we started putting humans into space. And one of the ones that's pretty remarkable, I'm sure you heard about it, was the uh, experiment with the one year in space, also the twin study. So this is Navy retired now, Navy Captain Scott Kelly. There's Scott and his 
identical twin brother, Navy Captain Mark Cowley. So both of them were uh, Navy F-18 pilots, test pilots, and astronauts. And so we had an opportunity to send Scott to space with um, Misha Kornienko from Russia and uh, be able to study. Actually, this was two studies, the year in space and the twin study. The year in space, both of these men spent an entire year in space. So we could study both of them and see what change, changes showed up in both, the similarities. With the twin study, Mark on the ground went through all the same uh, experiment and exercise protocols. And so what we can look at there, and by the way, these studies are not over. They will continue for years. What are the deltas? What are the differences between these two identical twins? So the researchers are just going nuts with this. It's, it's super. I mean, I don't know that we'll ever have quite an opportunity like this again. So this is going to be important. However, this is a small sample size. So what this will do is identify what we need to look at closer and potentially develop more uh, experiments and protocols for. So um, how am I doing on time? All right, I'm good. So I can talk, go a little bit deeper on uh, the human body and the human performance. What are we concerned about? What are our challenges? Well, we. They're also they're the same things we're dealing with now. However, I will tell you on the International Space Station, we've got very good connectivity. And uh, the crews on board can pick up the phone and with the internet protocol can dial in any number they want. They can call you. You can't call them though, sorry. No robocalls. So, uh, but they can call. We have, um, it's not quite Skype, but you know, we can have a two-way video uh, telecon with uh, family members. They can email all day long and everything. We're talking to mission control. Very good connectivity, very similar to, uh, not quite that connected, but uh, our ships, you know, in remote places of the world, our Navy ships, even our, our Marines deployed in different places with satellite phones and stuff, we have very good connectivity right now. But um, that's not gonna be the same as we get further out into space and we go into, um, into deep space, whether it's back to the moon or onto Mars. So what we're worried about, I'll just list them real quick. Radiation, we're gonna have greater radiation. Isolation, because we're not gonna have that connectivity so much with the family. Just that great distance. Uh, we talked about the calm delays. The gravities, uh, the gravities are different. Uh, we leave here, one gravity. Uh, we get out into space, we feel microgravity. If we go to the moon, it's one sixth gravity. If we go to Mars, it's one third of Earth's gravity. So the transitions between that's pretty important. So that was all the living and working. How do we get back? Let's go ahead to the next slide. So uh, getting back, we're still working on that one. But uh, going back to our uh, Orion capsule, back in December of 2014, we had experimental flight test number one, where we actually uh, launched the Orion capsule on a Delta IV heavy. And uh, it came back down in the Pacific Ocean and uh, that should look familiar because our recovery process was pretty much the same uh, as it was during the Apollo days from the Navy. By the way, uh, back during Apollo, Navy formed uh, the Navy Spacecraft Recovery Task Force 140. And between uh, 1961 and 1974, they uh, recovered 31 uh, manned spacecraft missions. Go ahead. That's the uh, Anchorage, USS Anchorage that assisted us. Next slide. And uh, here's some of our uh, uh, Navy divers and also uh, EOD team members. Next slide. Uh, notice they all have cameras on their helmets, so we got some good pictures. Next slide. And the really cool thing this time is we were able to just bring the Orion capsule right into the well deck. I mean, this was, this was awesome. Bring it right into the well deck. Next slide. And there it is. Just, uh, just works well. So we have been working with the U.S. Navy on the recovery of the Orion. So the Navy is definitely intimately involved with our uh, human space program. Speaking of which, our future explorers. So we never lack for uh, volunteers. Anybody in here want to go to Mars? A few people. Uh, this past year, uh, we were selecting a new astronaut class. We had 18,300 applications. And we selected these 12 people. And among those 12 is our 54th Naval Academy graduate to be selected as a, a Navy astronaut, Lieutenant Caleb Barron. There's three Navy members in this class. This is a class that will help us develop uh, the uh, 
spacecraft and the techniques and the operations to uh, explore even deeper in space. And we hope that they'll be able to see something like this. This is actually uh, the view of Earth from Mars, taken from one of our rovers. Do you see it? <laughs> Go ahead, next slide. Go ahead and push it. Okay, if you look really, really close, there's a little faint dot right there. That's the Earth. That's what Earth looks like from the surface of Mars. Go ahead. So, um, mentioned before, was a science fiction writer and Naval Academy graduate of the class of 1929, Robert Heinlein, said that everything is theoretically impossible until it's done. Footsteps on the lunar surface, astronauts on the lunar surface, rovers on Mars, and of course, in the future, humans on Mars. So we are uh, building hardware. This is this is not science fiction. The hardware is being built. We are developing the uh, technology. We're continuing the research on the International Space Station. And uh, this is happening now. And it turns out, as an aside, as we develop this technology and better understand this environment in space, there are applications right here back on Earth as we better understand all of this and how it interacts with the, with the human body and just in general, the technology. So we continue to uh, interact with uh, the US Navy and the Marine Corps. And I am absolutely convinced that we have the best analogs that, uh, and experience that the Na Navy and Ma Marine Corps brings when they come to uh, NASA for human exploration. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And we'll open up to questions at this time. We've got about five minutes for questions. Okay. Actually, uh, just I can give you the first question. What are we looking at here? This is a uh, this is a view from the cupola that is attached to the International Space Station. I had the great opportunity to install the cupola on the International Space Station in uh, February of 2010. So this now gives us a much greater uh, vantage point. The cupola is like a huge bay window. You can easily put the whole crew in there. And you cannot even take the view in just looking one way. You physically have to turn your body around to see all the way around. So uh, it typically faces down towards the surface of the Earth. And uh, you're just looking at, you know, as we go by. This is sped up, of course. But one of the things I will uh, have you notice, and you can go online. I do encourage you to go onto the NASA websites um, and uh, even the NASA YouTube channels. And you'll see a really thin blue line right there. That's our entire atmosphere. That's what protects us here on the surface of the Earth. Yes, sir. You talk a bit about uh, SpaceX and the way in which privatization of uh, rocket launch and, and uh, space travel will affect our ability to get to Mars and hands or complicate it. Sure. Uh, so the question is, you know, how is uh, commercial involvement going to enhance, or how does that play with our journey to Mars? Uh, very much hand in hand. We're so uh, pleased that we're finally at a point where we, we NASA, have contracted with commercial companies to uh, provide the service uh, from the surface of the Earth up to the space station. We haven't had our first crewed missions yet, but we have two companies um, that are developing uh, that capability because certainly for more than 50 years, NASA has been putting humans into low Earth orbit. Now we put 24 humans all the way out to the moon. Those are the only 24 that have ever you know, been further. But we actually really embrace the uh, commercial interaction with NASA because we certainly can't do it on our own. And we love the fact that they can potentially spin this off to help enhance the, the economy, the US economy, by uh, um, developing commercial capabilities that would be applicable to folks outside of NASA. So thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. What, if anything, would you say from your experience during your four years at the Naval Academy helped make you, help prepare you for your, your career as an astronaut? Uh, I like that question. What, in my experience at the Naval Academy, helped me in my career as an astronaut? The first was early leadership uh, ca uh, experiences. You know, whether it's uh, in the company in Bancroft Hall or even I was on the offshore sailing team. So uh, early on, uh, you know, I was, by the time I was a first class, I was a skipper of one of the 44s. 
and you know, taking, taking a crew offshore into the Atlantic for that type of real conditions, those leadership lessons early on. And then also uh, the, the crew or the team mentality. You know, it's, it's not about me, it's about the whole crew, and we certainly do that at NASA. And uh, if you notice somebody else, you know, needs a hand, you, can, you don't just fold your arms and stand back and go, well, that's not my job. You know, you're absolutely jumping in, or if that person is doing this and they got behind, and their next task is not being done, you jump in and do that one, and you're constantly helping each other out. So early leadership lessons and the crew or team mentality. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I'm sure you saw The Martian. Yes. So in watching through that interesting little movie was full of, full of all these individual vignettes. What in there struck you as, boy, I don't know that I could ever have done that. And what in there might you have done differently? Good question. So from the movie The Martian, uh, what parts would I say I wouldn't have done that or, or what was I'm not, right? I'm not really talking about this. There were, they took some license with some things. Sure. So I'm not really talking about those. But my, my, me personally. Things that were possible. Uh, oh, the things that were possible? Yeah. A lot. There were a lot of things that were possible because I will tell you that the author of the book uh, spent a lot of time on NASA blogs. <laughs> Seriously, before he wrote the book, um, kind of having conversations. Well, what about this? What about that? So you actually see a lot of NASA technology planned. NASA technology in that movie. Now there was some poetic license with some of the some of the physics. Uh, you know, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, I won't spoil it for you. But uh, for me personally, that was a pretty darn smart astronaut. And uh, let me tell you, I think it's about the caliber of the twelve that we've just recently picked. Do you think you could have established communications the way you did? Uh, yeah, it's funny. We've talked about that. The question is, would I have established communications the way he did? I think instead of getting real complicated, I actually would have written a few signs, you know, actually put it in plain English at first. But, but anyway, uh, these are some of the challenges. I mean, we have to think through these scenarios. So first of all, you know, we plan for the nominal uh, operation of our systems. But just like the Navy and NASA especially, we have to plan contingency plans for what if this fails, what if this fails, what if this fails. Uh, we call it uh, fail safe and fail, uh, fail operational fail safe. The first failure, you're still operational. The second failure, you're still safe and maybe you're aborting and coming home. So uh, we're having to look at that level of safety and, and how, what is the level of our acceptance of risk as we go out there. So obviously this, there's a lot of unknowns as much as we study all this, uh, there's still going to be unknowns that we're going to encounter, and we just need to be able to adapt and, and adjust to that. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Thank you.